Hi, everyone. Um, I do have some glowing science here. I'm just going to need a volunteer to hold on to it. Ed? <laughs> now, everyone, that, that is safe. But those of you who are sitting next to Ed, you just might want to move back <laughs> from him a bit. Um, if you feel any funny sensations, do see your doctor. Thank you all very, very much for being here today. I come to you from the league of clickers that do not work. <laughs> Give me just one moment. Have you turned it off and on again? Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, good. Worst inventions in the world, computers, clickers, presentation devices. So <clears throat> let's try that again. I come to you from the league of overambitious new inventors engineers, and scientists. <laughs> Our organization has achieved something of a bad reputation as of late. And I am willing to admit this is not entirely undeserved. When one of our members decided to create and market cocaine toothache drops to children, That was probably not the most wisest thing in the world. So I'm glad that you've all come together today because I have a message for all of you, the inventors of tomorrow. Please don't screw up. <laughs> if you are going to invent asthma cigarettes, for the effective treatment of asthma, hay fever, foul breath, all diseases of the throat, head colds, canker sores, and bronchial irritations, please market them responsibly and do not recommend them for children under the age of six. <laughs> so from these inventions, what can we learn? Let's look at some of the inventions which really should never have been. Some of the most earliest inventions in our history have come from harnessing animal power. The plow, the millstone, the cart. <laughs> but inventions only started to truly flourish when we reached the Victorian era. And we discovered that we could not only harness animal power, but also animal intelligence. This wonderful discovery resulted in the brilliant Tempest Prognosticator, of which I have an old photograph of here. The Tempest Prognosticator was invented by Dr. George Merriweather in the year 1851. It employed a redundant array of inexpensive leeches, <laughs> or rail, in order to predict the weather. Now, it's a little known fact that leeches are agitated by oncoming storms. And this was mainly of use to, to seaside ports where they needed to know about storms approaching. The behavior of the device was simple. All you had was a glass jar with a leech inside it. When the leech became agitated, it would climb the side of the jar, dislodging a piece of whalebone. That would be uh, the force of that would then be communicated via a wire, chain, and pulley to a small hammer at the top of the device, which would then ring a tiny bell. Based upon the intensity and how often the bells rang, you could tell how nasty the oncoming storm would be. One of Dr. Merriweather's colleagues described this as one of the grandest ideas that ever <laughs> emanated from the mind of man. You will also note that it made use of glass bottles. Now, I come from a system administration background. 
I would have thought that was because it makes monitoring easier, but it's not. In the documentation that came with the device, it was said that glass bottles were used so that the little comrades do not endure the affliction <laughs> of solitary confinement. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. This was social networking for leeches. The Tempest prognosticator was surprisingly accurate, but for some reason it was not very widely adopted. <laughs> There's a few reasons as to why this was the case. The marketing was pretty good, um, but it seems to have come down to the undesirable form of maintenance to keep the device running. But this brings us into it. <laughs> Are you okay there, Ed? I might do some warnings for Ed's sake when we get to the, the nasty bits. <laughs> this brings us into an interesting discussion, an interesting idea of blood-fueled devices, because you can do some cool things with these. Some of you might remember a few years ago, um, there was the Scove versus Novell battle. <laughs> and the Scove lawyers were desperately looking for a way that they could gain an edge. And so they came up with a wonderful idea. Not only could you write your name in blood, there was a device invented, Ed, close your eyes, please, a device invented that allowed you to write entire documents in blood. <laughs> and the operation of this device is absolutely fascinating. But wouldn't it be cool, sorry, most people have figured out that blood is not a suitable thing for machines. Blood does not mean fuel. But wouldn't it be cool if it was? Imagine all the awesome things you could do if you could power machines on blood. One of those cool things would be this. We pretty much have the technology to create an active tattoo. So this is an embedded display just under the skin, and you can have it read out interesting things, like your biometrics, or use it as a phone display. I hear the next Android phones are going to come with this. So yeah, when you come to like the Android Summit next year, yeah, bring your pain pills. <laughs> the trouble with these, how do you power them? Well, there does exist blood glucose fuel cells, and they work pretty well, but the problem is that they get poisoned very, very easily. If you consume the wrong substances, you can break your fuel cells. So wouldn't it be great instead if we had fuel cells that could self-repair, living fuel cells? Well, scientists in Japan have done exactly this. They've created an embedded yeast matrix which uses some very, very clever biochemistry. It looks like this, and that's a very, very small device. It's 15 millimeters square, it's 1.4 millimeters thick, so it's absolutely tiny. But the cool thing about these devices is not only are they embeddable, but they're scalable. So I'm looking forward to being able to mount one of these on my back and power my laptop off it. <laughs> the great way in which these work is they use yeast to produce power. And most of us are familiar with how yeast operate. Sugar and oxygen produces water, carbon dioxide, and through some clever chemistry, usable power. The problem with these devices, however, comes under high load. Now, as you know, that's the normal way in which yeast digests sugars. But under high load, such as when the user is exercising heavily, you can end up with a shortage of oxygen, which gives you an anaerobic reaction, which we're also familiar with. <laughs> Some users do consider this to be a feature, however. <laughs> Another field of astonishingly bad inventions comes to toys. Now, if you think about toys, they should be innocent things. They should be fun. They should be inspirational. They should be educational. But sometimes, sometimes, toys go wrong. 
The year is 1996, and Cabbage Patch doll sales are flagging. Mattel is desperate for a way to reinvigorate the market, and they come up with a masterstroke. The Cabbage Patch Kids Snack Time Kid. You will note on the box, it says, feed me. I really eat my plastic snacks. The way in which this doll worked was wonderful. The doll came with a number of small plastic snacks, like bananas and carrots and chocolate bars and so on. And you could feed it these plastic snacks. And it would digest them using a pair of one-way metal rollers to grind the snack into dust. <laughs> it was an absolute marketing genius. <laughs> because what they had done is taken the consumable culture of inkjet printers and applied it to toys. The problem, of course, is that when the children ran out of snacks, if their parents didn't purchase them anymore, the children would look for other things to feed the toys. <laughs> what other things could we put in a toy's mouth? Ed, you might want to close your eyes again. <laughs> Fingers? Oh. And most disturbingly, hair. The way in which the dolls operated is as long as the mouth sensors detected there was something in the mouth, the industrial strength rollers would operate. Now, it is possible to turn the doll off. If you have a doll that's attached itself to your hair, you simply have to remove the backpack, locate the battery compartment, undo it, and remove the batteries. That sounds simple, but when you have a zombie-like doll <laughs> trying to eat your brain, <laughs> there were more than 100 documented injuries before the device underwent a full product recall <laughs> and immediately became a hot collector's item on eBay. <laughs> Continuing with our toys, Melty Beads. Few people in the audience may have used Melty Beats. The idea of Melty Beats, oh, wonderful people with their hands up. The wonderful thing about Melty Beats, you lay them out in a cool shape. You use an iron or an oven or some sort of heat source. And you end up with a trinket of your own design. These are really, really cool for kids and adults alike. The problem with Melty Beads is that they require high temperatures. And usually, high temperatures and small children are not a good mix. So in an effort to make a more child-friendly version of Melty Beads, Aquadots were created. Now, Aquadots, also known as Bindies, Bindos, or Pixos, were awarded Toy of the Year in 2007. What made them special is that rather than heating these beads to activate them, they had a water-activated adhesive. So you only needed to spray them with water or if you didn't have a water spray, you just lick them before <laughs> placing them in the tray. There was, however, a small problem in their manufacture. When the specs for these were sent to the factory, it was said that they should use 1,5-pentane diol, which is a relatively harmless plasticizer. However, the factory that produced them substituted the much cheaper 1,4-butane diol as a plasticizer. Now, what's interesting about 1,4-butane diol is that when metabolized, it turns into gamma-hydroxybutyric acid. <laughs> which is also known as GHB. 
or by its street names of GBH, <laughs> Liquid Ecstasy, or Fantasy. One or two beads would keep a child amused for hours. <laughs> But more than that, invariably required a trip to the hospital. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, this product too underwent a full product recall. But what's the best toy that I could find? The most wonderful scientific toy that I could find? Well, it would be the Gilbert Uranium 238 <laughs> Atomic Energy Lab. Everything the budding nuclear scientist needs. This wonderful device included a range of instruments. It included a Geiger counter for detecting radiation. It included a cloud chamber so you could see particle effects in action. And of course, what energy lab would be complete without four actual samples of uranium ore? Also, because this is aimed at children, it came with a comic book. Learn how Dagwood splits the atom. <laughs> but my favorite part of this kit is that small brown book there, Prospecting for Uranium. <laughs> was only produced for a single year. It was discontinued due to lack of sales, not due to safety reasons. Another fascinating area of bad inventions is that of emergency devices. I find these particularly interesting because emergency devices, by their very nature, are very rarely used. And so there is a strong motivator for companies trying to differentiate themselves in the market to optimize for secondary issues. So most of us are familiar with a simple fire alarm. But there's a problem with fire alarms, and that is that sometimes people set them off as pranks. So wouldn't it be good if we had a fire alarm that could catch miscreants who are setting these off as a prank? Sure enough, one of those got invented. I'm not sure if you can read the text here, but it says demonstrated above is a new fire signal box that locks the hand of the alarm sender into a release by a policeman or fireman with a key, thus deterring the sending of false alarms. Just to make that absolutely clear what this device does, <laughs> it traps your arm <laughs> near a blazing inferno. <laughs> and yet, this has inspired many modern designs in emergency devices, such as the emergency button that you can't press unless you have a key. <laughs> so in this new age, where people are disinclined to activate the fire alarm, Fire survival now becomes paramount. So imagine, if you will, that you're trapped inside a burning hotel. Unless the fire is very close to you, the chances are that you will die from smoke inhalation far before the flames ever reach you. In this circumstance, what you need is a fresh air breathing device, which was the title of US patent 4243, sorry, 20756. This is an invention that is so brilliant, 
so masterful, so inspired in its design, that I cannot do it justice in words. So instead, I will merely give you a diagram from the patent application. The inventor of this device suggested that it be installed in all hotel rooms and be given to emergency services workers in case they should ever need some fresh air. <laughs> I'm glad we went a different route there. But what about today, in the modern age? Well, you might remember that I talked about the intelligence of animals we've also been using animals for intelligence. The CIA, a number of years ago, had a project entitled Acoustic Kitty. The idea was to take a, a cat and train it to be a spy. <laughs> the Acoustic Kitty budget was $20 million. <laughs> in training and cybernetic cat devices. Its first mission, after all that money was spent, was to spy on a suspected Russian meeting happening in a park. The cat was driven to near the park, given its orders, and released into the field. The total time before failure of the mission was 12 seconds. <laughs> As the cat crossed the first street, it was struck by a passing cab <laughs> and killed instantly. The other thing that you might discover we have in the modern age is advertising. Advertising you will see everywhere. And if you happen to be in the Ukraine, the fog is so thick that you get advertising in the sky, you can actually project advertisements onto the fog in the sky. My recommendations here is that if you're going to do this, make sure that your operating system is stable. <laughs> Hopefully you have been inspired and learnt from some of the devices I've covered today. And so I want to leave with a device for you, the inventors and creators of tomorrow. How many of you drive? Lots. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could work more effectively while driving? Wouldn't it be great if you could use your laptop while driving? So you can actually purchase from Amazon the laptop steering wheel desk <laughs> for the low price of $18.75. This fits to your steering wheel and allows you to be more productive while driving. <laughs> I've personally found this device to be invaluable. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. This has been a public service announcement from the League.